This episode is brought to you by Michigan Economic Development Corporation. In Michigan, you can have both a rewarding career and a quality lifestyle with plentiful career opportunities in world-changing, innovating industries, from electric vehicles to clean energy to biotech, with room for advancement no matter where you are in your career. Plus, Michigan offers a welcoming, beautiful, affordable, and inclusive community for all. Live your best life. You can in Michigan. Visit themichiganlife.org. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. I just want to jump in here with a quick note about some changes that are happening. This podcast is now going ad-supported. What that means is I will be releasing select episodes from the hundreds of episodes I have archived now on Patreon and releasing them here. And a lot of these were recorded a couple of years ago during 2020 especially. However, I have gone through them and deemed that the parenting information was still really relevant. So just be aware that some of these releases may be out of order chronologically. Also, if you would like to listen to the podcast ad-free, you can still join Patreon. I'll still be releasing podcasts there with a few bonuses. One is that it will be ad-free. One will be that you get the podcast slightly earlier than everybody else. And I'll also be doing a bonus episode every month with a Q&A that's patron specific. So if that's something you'd like to do, you can join for a dollar a month and we'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, welcome, welcome. Thank you, as always, for being here, and thank you for your patronage. I truly appreciate it. So today, I want to talk about my workflow and how I, quote unquote, get so much done. (laughs) Apparently, it looks to the rest of the world as though I get a lot done and I do it all, which I don't. I don't do it all. And if you've listened to my other podcasts, if you've you know, familiar with my work at all, you know that I don't claim to do it all. I think balance is a verb. It's not a destination. And we're all just kind of struggling to manage all the things that have to happen in a day. And of course, no one can do it all, right? And I've often used this analogy. Uh, To me, life is a four burner stove. A couple of pots are simmering. There's always a pot that's boiling. And I'm kind of always shuffling like, what is boiling at the moment. And at any given time, you know, there's, there's definitely something that's simmering that can wait. Usually for me, that's housework (laughs) or it's so funny. Um, my dad was driving in my car and he was so, he was furious because he was like, your car is so dirty. Your car is so dirty. And I was like, dad, I don't have time to like I don't go get my car washed. It's just not an important thing to me. (laughs) He was like super distressed about it. So cleaning definitely for me is a simmering pot on my big four burner stove. Yeah, I'm tidy and organized, but I can't say that I'm a deep cleaner. So (laughs) just so you know, you know, I'm a single mom, I'm homeschooling. And one of the things I think that really helps me and Pascal is I don't overschedule we take just about every other day off from activities and, you know, be it homeschooling, be it social, be it sports. He's only allowed to do one seasonal sport at a time. So I'm not that, I don't, I don't love, you know, driving kids around. I don't love that whole, um, I don't know. I coached baseball and I found kids were doing three or four sports and they would be late to my practice after leaving their soccer practice early. And it, It really, it was heartbreaking to me because I think the reason kids do team sports under, I don't know, under their teenage years for for sure is, you know, to be part of a team, to for good sportsmanship. Uh, Yes, for athletic ability, but the idea that kids will be in several different sports at the same time and leave a team early to arrive late at another practice to me is not good sportsmanship. So 
it also, I see parents like having dinner in the car. I see parents running ragged. And so I just, that's how I've chosen our life is one seasonal sport at a time. And that keeps our time a little more open. I also really like, I really like to keep my calendar open because I find I don't know, for me anyway, the way I've crafted my life, and probably this is a personality trait as well, is that I find that I love impromptu things. I like to leave the calendar open because the way our life and friendships are structured is it just always seems like somebody's popping up with something fun. Hey, you want to go to the beach? Hey, you want to come over? Hey, you want to do this? And so I like to keep that really available and open because the spontaneous things feel really fun too. So I think you know, those things are really important for how I remain calm, I would say in my life, right? Like I remain not overall stressed, but there's also like a workflow that I have. And I didn't realize till I was working with a business partner, you know, and she was like, dude, your workflow is crazy. And we were trying to like identify some of my weak spots. So one of my weak spots for sure is um, social media. My Instagram game is horrific. And so I'm trying to, you know, we're, we're going through and I'm trying to like identify the chinks in my armor and why my Instagram game is so bad. <laughs> and, and definitely, you know, one of the things you want to look for is if you are struggling with workflow, if you're struggling with a certain portion of your work or your day, it's worth it to like investigate the personal reasons why. So for me, Social media is really hard because my work as a potty trainer, because my work in parenting, people literally like claw at me for solutions and especially in the potty training realm. So when I post something, I can get inundated. So that's hard because of time. Like there's an entitlement of people. It's really weird. Like I wrote a book and suddenly people feel like I'm totally responsible for every single person potty training well and effortlessly. (laughs) And I'm like, dude, like, no, it's a $10 book, you know, like I can't millions of people buy it. (laughs) So there's definitely that. So I looked beyond, you know, I looked beyond that. And I also, um, people are rude. There was a thread, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago, and I had put a quote and then elaborated on the quote. And this woman came at me and literally, not only did she disagree, but she was like, oh, good for you. You wrote a book. I guess that supposedly makes you think you're so great. Like she came at me super personal. I'm just a person, you guys. <laughs> like, you know, so it can be really, it can be just really, um, what do I want to say? Overwhelming, but it can drag your heart down. You know, when you put, when you invest your time and energy, and trying to help people. And then people just want to slam you on the internet. The internet, of course, you know, has gotten to be a really yucky place. So anyway, all by way of saying like, not to feel bad for me or anything like that, but that's a chink in my armor because I have this like reticence, uh, this um, dragging my feet in the sand about, you know, posting on social media because I'm going to get this like rebound yuckiness. And I've said this before in a podcast, and this might be surprising to you, but I get death threats. Like I get death threat emails because potty training is taking too long, <laughs> so, which, you know, I, I realize speaks more about the other person than me, but it's still, it affects, it affects you. And so, you know, identifying that helps me at least understand that like, oh, okay, I'm not being lazy. I'm not being this. Another thing is I am not a great picture taker. My child is 14. It's really hard for me to find photos sometimes that go with what I want to talk about. So All of these things are just ways that me and my business partner just figured out, again, where the chinks in the armor are, why why it's not laziness, right? So a lot of times we're procrastinating or we're not getting something done in our workflow and we like do negative self-talk or we think bad about it. We're like, oh, I'm just being lazy. Oh, I can't get my shit together. What's wrong with me? That kind of thing. So it's really worth it to figure out like the mental game and what's going on. And we all, like all of us, Nobody's just always full of self-confidence and and doesn't have feelings about how other people treat them or or what's going to happen with their work. So it's worth investigating that because that can help your workflow as well. And whatever that is, if it could be, you know, maybe parenting is your workflow. How can you be a better parent? And so figuring out the chinks in your armor are always worth it, right? Like if you know, you know, you're weak in a certain area of parenting, how can you address that or it, it's just, I think it's worth figuring out where your vulnerabilities are. So that's one part of it. Now, 
The other part is like how I actually work. And I had to pull it apart from my business partner because I was, it's so obvious to me because I've been doing it so long. It's so inherent that pulling it apart was kind of, um, it was kind of awesome. And she was like, dude, this is a podcast. Like, this is so, this is so interesting. So for me as a female and your dads, just bear with me for a minute as a female, bar none, my workflow is based on my menstrual cycle and hear me out because I don't even realize I do this, but I, this started for me when I was in circus school way back in the day. And a couple of trapeze artists and I had figured out that everything had to do with your menstrual cycle and where your hormones were. So for me, and I think everybody's different, but I know that there are some, I know there's a couple of like doctor doctors turned like health coach turned personal trainers who work with women on high level performance athletics based on their menstrual cycle. Because of the hormones, you are at various times in the month, super strong, super creative, super lazy, (laughs) super bloated. So it's really worth looking into this, not just for athletics, but for creativity and for workflow. So for me, literally after I start bleeding, I have two weeks where I'm like super, oh my God, everything's on fire. I am on fire. These are the days that I am also like really, you know, if I'm uh, trying to watch what I'm eating or whatever, it's super easy. It's effortless, right? If I want to get creative work done, writing done, I might start stockpiling like my Instagram posts because I'm feeling like super juicy, super creative. I can work. I'm energized. I have this like endless flow of creative energy. So in circus school, this would be the times that we would like hit it really hard. Like if you're going to do you know, if you want to build your personal records, your personal reps, if you want to get abs, you know what I mean? These are, this is the time that you're going to work really hard. You're going to push past all your barriers. So this is the time you're going to try new tricks on the trapeze. You're going to probably map out a new routine because you're going to be overly ambitious. And, and so this is the stretching zone for me. This is the super creative place where I can stretch. Then ovulation happens and then things start to go downhill for the rest of the month as far as that energy. And it took me a long time to realize that it's not necessarily, I'm saying downhill because that's what it feels like. Oh my God, I can't do anything. I'm feeling lethargic or all of a sudden the creativity just sort of fizzles. Tune into this because it's really, it's very interesting. And I don't know, dads, for you guys listening, I don't know if there are hormonal changes for you throughout the month. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I have heard from men that they experience something akin to the menstrual cycle, obviously not, not anywhere near the same process, but hormonally there are shifts throughout the month. So, you know, if you have something to add, I'd love to hear about it, but I just have never investigated what this looks like for men. So anyway, so, uh, you know, as it relates to physicality in circus school, so then we would know that av- after ovulation, you were just more patient with yourself. That's where you would address like sort of the emotional stuff behind your routine and behind your your moves in the routine and the storytelling that you're doing. We would move slower and have longer rehearsals because we would actually activate this like a so tired can't really get our shit together. What does that bring to the routine? Because if you see good circus, they're telling a story and it's not just power move after power move, right? That's the Olympics. That's not what circus is about. There's like this more um, emotionality that you want to bring to it. So now as it relates to my work now, that's where I'm going to be slower moving. I'm going to honor some of the emotionality behind my work. That's where sometimes, you know, my work, especially my work with parents, there's a flow of old school, new school. There's a, there's a flow of, you know, sometimes you just got to be harsh. And then there's other times where it's like, no, you just have to lean in and connect. And so that helps with my workflow. So 100%, I want to do and stockpile a lot of my work as much as I can in those first two weeks of the month, and then slowly wind down for the rest of the month. So again, for me, it looks like batch work and trying to stockpile, you know, podcasts and blog posts and Instagram's, you know, post and and map that out. Now that's the monthly. And I just sort of do that intuitively and I am hitting menopause. So I'm, you know, definitely on an 18 day cycle now and I'm getting ready, you know, I'm skipping periods. So I have no idea what my creativity and what this flow is going to look like in menopause, but we'll see, you know, maybe I've just convinced myself that this is how it goes. (laughs) 
um, now I have a weekly flow. So the weekly flow for me is based on the sort of work calendar. And that's quite by accident because I don't have a typical, you know, nine to five job or a, a typical work. So I do take Sundays off though. And what I noticed particularly, you know, the pandemic was sort of just crazy. The whole world was potty training. So I was balls to the wall, busy. And like, of course, kids were falling apart. So my parenting side of my business was also balls to the walls busy. And so I take Sundays off and Sundays, I really try not to have any communication. It's a communication day off. I try not to log on to social media. I try to limit my texting unless I have friends, you know, plans with a friend. I really try to limit communication because I so communicate. If you've ever worked with me privately, we work on a walkie talkie app. I'm like in communication with clients all day long. And so it's vital for me on Sunday to just totally rest. And so what happens is I super recharge on Sunday and then Monday, it's same thing as like my menstrual cycle. Monday, I come into the week like oh my God, I have so much energy. I'm so ready to hit the week. So that's, again, where I'm going to batch work as much as possible. I'm going to try to get as much done on Monday as I can. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I am like on it. On Thursday, Friday, I start to wind down. And on Saturday, I log off at 5.30 Eastern time. And I am like literally watching the clock till I log off. And so like my day off begins at 5.31 on Saturday. (laughs) And I'm like, oh. And so there's this real flow. So on Monday, and Monday's like just this crazy day. Pascal has his drum lessons. He has his math tutor. Um, We have a boat. We have our archery class. You know, I have clients in between that. And it's just, it's this crazy day. And I still get so much creative work done because I'm just, I'm recharged. And so that's how I know a lot of people dread Monday, like go back to work. But for me, Monday and Tuesday are like, yeah, let's do it. So that's my weekly. And then I have a daily flow. And so my daily flow is based on a very early wake up. And I've made no bones about that. I'm a ridiculously early riser. I get up at usually 334, you know, sometimes 430. I like to work out. I like to trail run and I like to be out for the sunrise. So it's getting hard because the sun is rising now at like five. And so to like be on a trail for the sunrise is ridiculously early. But for work, here's what I have found. Number one, the best work is done in the dark. If you ask anybody who's written a book, they will tell you that a huge portion of their writing is done at around 3, 3.30 in the morning. There is a stillness and a quietness at that hour that allows you to get so much done. I don't, I'm just ridiculously productive before the sun comes up. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. <laughs> If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Obviously, people aren't emailing you. Nobody's on social media. So there's that. But there's just some magic in the dark. Here's the other thing about the dark. I do the hard thing first. And I read this in some productivity thing. I don't know. Maybe Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin. I love those guys, but I don't, some pro- productivity. I didn't come up with this myself, but do the hard thing first because once the hard thing's out of the way, the rest of the day becomes easier. If you save the hard thing, you spend a lot of time and energy kind of procrastinating to not get to the hard thing. For me, I like to do the hard thing in the dark, in the wee hours of the morning, because I don't know, it feels safer. I don't know. So for me, some of the hard things are confrontational emails when somebody's coming at me and I feel like I do need to reply or I have uh, boundaries can be hard. I'm, I'm often in corporate situations because of the potty training. I do like a lot of um, big nanny companies and things like that. So I do have some corporate obligations and sometimes there's negotiating for my services. There's negotiating for my price. And believe it or not, that's a challenge for me. I still 
at 51 years old, all the work I've done on boundaries, I still don't like confrontation. I still cry when I have to stand up for myself and advocate for myself. I'm much better at it than I was even, you know, a couple of years ago, but it's a work in progress. And so though those things are really hard for me. And so I do those, I do those in the, in the dark because I don't know if <laughs> It feels safer. Um, I feel more courageous. It feels like I'm able to just do it with more confidence. I have no idea what what's behind that. But anyway, that's that's how I work. Obviously, writing my books, those were it wasn't necessarily like those were hard. But again, I found like, OK, slam out this chapter. A lot of times I'll go to write a blog post or sketch out a podcast and I can't wrap my head around it, which means usually I'm trying to bite off more than I can chew. So then I have to do the hard. I do the hard thing first, do the hard thing first and in the dark. Now, this was really brought home to me. I've discussed this before in the pandemic episodes. This was really brought home to me in the pandemic because I could feel myself like by 11 a.m. I was fading. And for me during the pandemic, it was just the general lack of focus anxiety that I think so many people had talked about having, right? Like this weird just unfocused. We couldn't pull everything together, kind of wasted a lot of time on social media, wasted a lot of time on sourdough starters and learning how to knit. <laughs> Not that those are a waste of time, but you know, I just, this weird malaise, this weird, it seems hard to put my finger on it now that it's sort of fading, but I, I do remember that very clearly. Like this general can't get my shit together after 11 a.m. <laughs> and then I realized too, I would take a nap sort of that midday and then be recharged for around three. And that really worked for me. And it really works now just because of my life. And I know your life looks wildly different with little kids, but Pascal is now sleeping, you know, till 10 or 11, which I truly love being able to give him that time as a teenager because I wasn't allowed it when I was a teenager. And I just remember being so, so, so tired my teenage years. So he wakes up at that time and it's really funny because I'll like lay down and rest my eyes and then we'll hit the day at about one with all of his stuff. And so that feels like a really good cycle for where he is in life. Just as a total non sequitur, Pascal was always, always a 5 to 5.30 a.m. waker upper when he was, I'd say till he was about 10. And trust me, I tried everything to get him to sleep later. So I literally had somebody ask me that her, she said her son was waking up at 6.30 and that was an ungodly hour and he had to sleep later. And I was like, uh, I, I think 6.30 is pretty good, man. <laughs> So I think Pascal made me a morning person, but I was always praying for these teenage years when he would sleep in. So if your child is an early waker, I just want to send you a beacon of hope that they will be a teenager one day and sleep impossibly late. So there's that. That was my little non sequitur. But anyway, because of homeschooling and all that we do, it's just this is what's working for our schedule right now. And so that forms my daily Things. So I get all my creative stuff done. I work with clients. I get all of that done in the morning. And then I have time for him when he gets up. I rest. I definitely, I am the queen of the power nap. I didn't know this about myself, but I posted something on social media, like on my personal page. And a friend from high school said that this was my skill in life, that I literally, since she knew me in high school, I was, I have the ability to sit on the couch close my eyes and take a 15 to 20 minute nap and wake up totally recharged. I had no idea I've been doing this my whole life, but apparently that is one of my skills. <laughs> so midday, because I get up at a stupid hour, midday, I need a nap. And I, it, it's really quick. It's always about 20 minutes. And sometimes I don't actually sleep, but I got those. Um, oh, I think I talked about this before because I, I have the eye things, you know, that make you feel like a movie star. And I just close my eyes and I just breathe and it recharges me. So that also helps. And of course, I recognize I'm sharing my workflow in case something resonates with you. I'm not trying to brag or rub in your face that you have little guys that are up your ass all day. And that a lot of the stuff I'm talking about probably isn't feasible for you right now. But, you know, they're just things to think about and maybe you can institute them at some point in time. But I do think resting, whether it's going to bed early with your kids, whether it's um, taking a little nap when they take a nap, I think we can't underestimate the value of rest and how it recharges. 
So I just feel like I think that's such an important part of how I get so much done. And I, I always think for me, I'm just a very pragmatic person. Time and how I do my workflow, just like I talked about this in the earlier episode last season about the Pareto principle, it's it's an investment for me. It's always an investment. And it's the one thing we can't get back. So I, it's not that I... I waste plenty of time. I, I love watching movies midday. I love scrolling social just as much as the next person. It's not so much about wasting time, but it's like, what does time give me? So a 20 minute nap during the day buys me hours of energy later in the day. So that's a really good investment. If I try to power through and not nap and try to just have another cup of coffee, I'm dragging ass by three or 4 PM. That's too early to end the day. And so it really is. I encourage you to think of it like that. Like a small investment can yield you such great results. So where can you make those better investments in time? Yeah. Just like I say, like connecting with your kid, you know, in the connection chapter of, oh crap, I have a toddler. I talk about this idea that, you know, spending 15 minutes of solid connection with your kid can buy you two hours of really good behavior. That's a solid investment. And people, some people react strongly. They go, well, I don't necessarily, I don't have time, you know, every two hours to, you know, sit down and, and do a really concentrated activity with my kid. Or I don't have time to do a whiteboard every time we have a transition with them and they throw a fit. And I go, yeah, but if, but the time investment buys you so much. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you don't have time to do that, then you're dealing with an hour long tantrum. That's not a good investment. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Moving on, one of the things that really helps my workflow is digitally uncluttering. So I try to keep my inbox at zero, which is so satisfying. It's just so satisfying, you guys, to have an inbox at zero. Just make folders. Make folders for everything, and you can drop everything into folders if you are afraid of missing out on something. I, I couldn't even think of the word. I was like, what am I trying to say here? If you're trying, you know, if you think you need to save something and you're not sure what to do with it, make a folder. Just put it in the folder. I'm trying to talk faster because right outside my window, a huge construction truck just showed up. So I'm hoping I can finish this podcast before they start jackhammering my speed, my street. Um, here's my big secret about emails, digital clutter, and all that comes with it is I try to touch everything once. And again, I think I got this from Seth Godin or Tim Ferriss. I do not check emails if I don't have an hour to answer the emails. So the idea is you want to touch everything one time because otherwise you're wasting time and energy and mental space. So if I'm on my phone and I'm at the grocery store and I'm in line and I'm bored and I pick up my phone and I check my emails, but I don't have time to reply, I now have several emails that are on my mind that are taking up headspace that could be used for thinking about another podcast, thinking about an Instagram post, thinking about clients, thinking about a struggle that one of my clients is having. And believe it or not, some amazing work comes out of when you let your mind settle. I'll have a difficult potty training case and it'll be something I've never seen. And I'll, if I give it time to marinate and settle, it's amazing. I'll be like, oh my God, we have to try this. And so whatever your life looks like, you know, your work life, your parenting life, if you're struggling with something, let your mind go. You don't want to be filling your mind with all this needless things. And what I find about email is if you don't have time, if you're touching an email more than one time, it's taking up too much headspace. So don't do that to yourself, right? You want to keep your mind nice and clear. And this relieves a lot of this extraneous unfocus that we have, this fuzz from our digital life, right? Same thing with Facebook. If you're going to fucking listen to like, oh my God, the fighting right now, you know, somebody will get under your craw and you'll be like, fuck. And you'll be doing monologues to them. You know, you're in line at the grocery store and being like, well, that motherfucker, but, 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 but I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that I'm going to come back. Right? <laughs> like that's just mental energy that you don't need to give it. So like only touch everything once has been just such a guiding force in answering emails because you don't want it's going to sit, it's going to sit on your mind and it's going to, it's going to invade your space and your peace. So get it answer it. Yes, no, or put it in a folder and then you're done. And it's a really clean emotional transaction. So I would say that's one of the most helpful things that I have ever done. Digital clutter is a real thing and you have to stay on top of it. I, I regularly try to purge my pictures. I am awful, awful, awful about doing like photo books 
or anything like that. I still haven't done Pascal's baby book. All the shit's in a box. It's awful. It's just not my skill set. And I'll probably just have to hire somebody to do it because I can't. (laughs) So what I try to do is I try to purge the pictures to at least keep them, you know, within a reasonable realm of amount and quantity. And at some point I, you know, like I said, I, I probably am going to hire somebody to do this. At some point you got to cut your losses and be like, get a professional scrapbooker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if it's not your skill set, try to find somebody for whom it is their skill set. And, you know, I realize not everybody, you know, can just hire somebody to do, do whatever. But I know, for example, I have friends who are not, you know, not at all wealthy, but they hired a housekeeper because it's so worth their time and energy. So I really encourage you to hire it out if you can, you know, like whatever it is, whatever your weakness might be, it's super great to just hire it out. And I have over the years, you know, hired out, finding where my business weaknesses are, I've been able to hire out people to do it for me. And that's like, that's amazing too, right? You know, again, I realize that's a luxury for a lot of people, but you don't have to hire everything out. And often you can find the spare change to hire out a real weakness. All right. Not sure if you can hear that, but the construction has started. So (laughs) I am going to log off and I hope you guys have an awesome day. And I hope that uh, my workflow sheds some light and can help you rock on. All right. I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, yummy new book presale treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course, my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified Oh Crap consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.